Uh, with that, with that I, I would like to say a special thank you to Alumni Association for helping to make that. I would like to introduce Dr. Lisa Clint to say a few words. Hey everyone, um, thank you so much for, for being here as uh, Dr. Jesu said, and a great big thank you to our four alumni um, that, are, that are here tonight. And um, I'm just here introducing them because um, these all happen to be um, alumni from the accounting program. Um, so um, Deanna and Kristen are fairly recent graduates. They're working uh, in public accounting in the Albany area. And uh, Chris and Michelle um, graduated just a, just a little bit uh, longer ago, and um, both have, have started in public accounting and have moved into other things in the, in, in the business arena, which hopefully will be interesting to all of you. So, thank you. Thank you very much for that, Dr. Flynn. <laughs> and I am the Vice President of the Economics Club, and I would like to introduce the keyboard members right now. Hi, I'm Logan, I'm the President of the Economics Club. I am the PR of the Economics Club. I'm Wango, and I'm the Secretary of the Economics Club. So we will conduct this program by asking questions in order, ranging from Logan, me, Asia, to Michael, and we'll ask these questions in order. And at about 8.35, once we get through the general questions, we will move on to the Q&A session, where you can answer, ask them anything that you have on your mind, whether it relates to their career, their job, especially relating to their, how many how they got it, their life after graduation, of course, and anything really that piques your interest. Don't have any shame. And that's really why we're here for the program. And that's where it has like the best effect on you. Um, with this, you can also ask for the LinkedIn and you should heavily connect with them after the event as those can often lead to you getting a very nice job connection. And we just encourage you to ask a lot of questions. And so now I think we will begin with the general questions, first starting with Logan. First question for Joseph. Uh, what is life at the graduation for you? Thanks. So um, life after graduation is basically a complete 180 of everything that everyone in that room is doing right now. It's not sitting in the back row, it's sitting in the front row. It's waking up early, it's going to the gym, getting dressed, motivating yourself, showing up on time, showing up early, you know, doing adult type things. Like being hungover is not an excuse not to show up to work on time or at all. You know, the only person that's gonna push your career forward is yourself like in college teachers would remind you you have work do you have this do you have that do no one reminds me of anything i have to you have to manage your own time push yourself forward do your own stuff and that's how you're going to succeed no one else is going to do it for you um you know and don't feel entitled because every job you apply to there's a hundred other people willing to take that job that'll do everything you do and better. Oneonta is not known for their, I don't know, academics, let's say. They're not the Harvards or the Yales or the Browns. They're Oneonta. So you need to make yourself stand out by pushing yourself forward and raising your hand, stepping up for extra assignments, doing extra work. Thank you very much for that, Joseph. Uh, pretty funny, but I think there was a lot of truth in it. And now uh, moving in to Diana Hayes, I would like to ask you a question. Were there any skills you learned at Oneonta that set you up for success after graduation? And additionally, what extracurricular activities at Oneonta prepare you for your current position? So I would say some of the skills that I learned at Oneonta, one of the biggest ones is just being able to work with other people, like in a team. I know there's a lot of the management classes you get together and work in groups and that's definitely important. I mean, depending on what you do after graduation, but here um, at, I work at the Bonadio Group um, in Albany and I'm an auditor and all we do is work on a team. So we constantly work with each other and being able to communicate effectively with one another and get along with 
all different type of personalities that you'll encounter at whatever job you take on. Um, that's definitely important. And that's something that you definitely learn at Oneonta. Um, as far as extracurricular activities, I was involved in the accounting society. And that's actually where I kind of got my job was the Bonadio group came to the accounting society. That's how I learned about them. And then I ended up messaging a couple of the partners that came and they're the partners that are on my team today. So definitely getting involved. I don't know like majors, what everybody is, but if anybody is accounting, that's definitely a good tool to have. I know that a lot of firms come. We just came, Kristen and I actually, um, just came and talked to the Accounting Society a couple of weeks ago, and we are always looking for new people, new hires, anything. So um, that's definitely a good, a good extracurricular, I would say. Thank you for that. And this, this next question is for Kristen. What experiences at Oneonta helped you most after graduation? Furthermore, how has your experience on the Oneonta swim and diving team influenced your life after graduation? Did you learn any skills from it? Can you guys hear me okay? Hi. <laughs> okay. Um, so the first part of the question, I would say the same as Deanna. Um, team projects definitely helps because everything that we do as an auditor is in a team. Even if you're just working on like a cost report or a tax return, you're still in a team. Someone else is going to be looking at your work. You're going to be dealing with clients. Um, and really, the client is also a part of your team. So that's pretty cool. you got to learn how to like manage that and also work with different types of people. Um, a lot of people have different preferences and things like that. So you have to work around that. But for the most part, it's, um, it's a really good experience to work with. Um, I mean, you're working with your friends, some, some of them. So, um, like Deanna and I, we were friends in college and here we are now. So, that's pretty cool. Um, I'd also say the for the CPA exam, definitely of the material we went over in college. Um, Dr. Flynn and Foley Dano definitely helped me with a lot of those classes. Uh, so, if you are accounting, definitely pay attention because that stuff will be on the CPA exam. Um, I also thought that the practice interviews we did and some of like the presentations we did, like I think it was organizational behavior, I want to say the class was called. Um, that was very helpful, especially with like getting a job or like an interview or internship, I mean. Um, but yeah. Thank you, Krista. This next question is for Christopher. So you were in public accounting for eight years before changing careers and becoming a financial advisor. Looking back on that, would you have made any changes to your career path? So I think I could have been more efficient in my overall progression from, from public accounting into financial advising. Um, so as just an example of some of those efficiencies that you see in, in hindsight, um, my previous firm had a branch of its of its company that dealt with uh, financial advising and investments. And if I was, took a more initiative, and this goes back to what Joe was saying before, of you have to push yourself and, and you can't come complacent. So if I was a little more proactive, I could have gotten into that financial advising part of it. And again, the reason for me thinking about going away from public accounting and towards financial advising is, the further I got into the role, going from staff accountant to senior to manager, the part that I enjoyed the most about doing that job was the interaction with the clients. And as I progressed higher and higher, I was doing more review of tax returns and less interaction with the clients. And so I wanted to transition to something that was a little bit more client forward. So, you know, to, to make a long story short, I. I still think that going from public accounting to financial advising, I wouldn't change the progression. I think there's there's so many good skills that you learn from doing the tax and audit side of things that translate really nicely into basically any other career after. 
Um, but definitely in hindsight, there's there's definitely points I can say uh, I was I was coasting for a little bit, and that's kind of the one cautionary tale I would say is is if, you know if you're if you're not always learning something, then you need to re, you know reevaluate you know what you're doing. Um, don't become complacent. So that's my thoughts on that. Yeah, that's very helpful. Uh, next question for Joe. What skills and knowledge did you learn throughout the program that you found most useful in your career? So the most basic skill as an accountant was, I don't even remember what it was called, but I guess accounting 100 or accounting 101. Um, you know, that has stayed with me for the past however many years since I graduated. Um, some of the classes that you take, and Flynn, please forgive me for saying this, but uh, like governmental accounting, you know, unless you're going into governmental accounting, will never apply to you ever again. Not saying they're not important. You know, every class has its merits, but uh, you know, the basic really stay with you forever. Company to company, you know, I've switched jobs a couple times. Each company uses a different software. They have different processes. They do things their own way. You know, so as long as you understand the basics and the concepts, you know, everything else is going to be easy. Uh, the most important thing I took away from Oneonta is my experiences and, you know, lifelong friends. I consider Chris on this call one of my closer friends. Um, you know, we met in whatever, Flynn's class, Accounting 100, or Buchan's class, and we've stayed friends ever since. So just cherish the experience and understand the concepts, and then you're good to go. Thank you very much for that. I remember Dr. Frohl, Obi Leno told me, balance, 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 and I never forgot that. <laughs> um, the next question for Deanna is, what one piece of advice do you have for any upcoming grads or graduates? Um, so I would say the biggest piece, again, for accounting, um, if you are thinking of going for your CPA or working towards that, I would say see if you can start while you're there. I know it sounds ridiculous because people said that to me, and I was like, absolutely not. Why would I want to ruin my last year of college? And, but it really is important. Once I was lucky enough to start my job, two months after I graduated, which it was lucky, but then at the same time, you jump right into work now full-time, and it can be a, a big transition from college to working in this industry, um, and then you move up. You move up pretty quickly in public accounting. If you're good at what you do, you can move up pretty fast. I've only worked here for two years and a couple months, and I went from assistant to senior auditor, um, so you move up really fast and just with moving up comes a lot of responsibility. So I have not passed on my CPA exams. <laughs> so that's why I say, if you are thinking about it while you're in the study zone of school and you're used to taking tests, you're used to pulling all nighters, you're used to staying up late, you're in that type of regimen, it's definitely more feasible than when you wait to get out. Um, so that's just one piece of advice. I don't know if anybody wants to hear that, but that would be my tip. Oh, the all-nighters don't stop after after college. You still no, they definitely don't. Seasons. But they're definitely less. At least when I was a student, I was all-nighters for every exam. So <laughs> I'm definitely not that way anymore. Um, but yeah, so that, that's what I would say. <laughs> Okay, um, Kristen, what are the things you like most about working in accounting? Um, so I kind of touched on working with teams. I've always liked working with teams. Um, but another aspect of that that I really enjoy is teaching. I really like teaching now that I'm a senior, same with Deanna. Um, we're now teaching the new people that are coming in, the assistants. And we're also constantly learning. It's not like it's boring. We're, every client's different. Year to year, it's different. It's not, I feel like typically you think of accounting 
as like a boring thing, like especially a lot of people who don't know anything about accounting. Um, but it's definitely not boring. Um, and it's very like quick pace, I would say, in public accounting. Um, one of the things I definitely don't love though is the CPA exam. So definitely listen to Deanna, get it done early. Um, I have one test that I'm hopefully done with, but we'll see. Um, yeah, and it's very time consuming. So if you do choose to go with public accounting, definitely do it. It also can hinder you. Like if you become a senior and you don't get your CPA, a lot of times firms won't let you move up after that. You'll be stuck in like a super senior sort of, they say. So um, if you're thinking public accounting, definitely take it now if you can. I wish I knew I could take it earlier. I would have, um, yeah, because it definitely gets harder. But yeah, and I also like um, like visiting with clients and stuff. We get to travel a little, nothing crazy at Bonadio, but you know, like next week I'm going to Poughkeepsie. Like sometimes you're in the office, sometimes you're working from home. Like you kind of get to travel. It's very flexible, so I definitely like that. And I also like all the vacation time we get and all the benefits we get. And um, also we have like a lot of holiday parties. We had one today um, and volunteer day. I really like that day. We all go out in the community and teams and go to our clients and volunteer and just have fun with them for a day. It's really fun. So yeah, it's a good career. Thank you, Chris. This next one's perfect. So for them. What is something you wish you knew going into the workforce that you had to learn the hard way? Um, there's a couple of things. Uh, some stuff that comes to mind is that you, you definitely want to surround yourself with good people. And what, what I mean by that is two of the firms that I worked for, the first one was very happy just sort of coasting along. They weren't trying to grow the firm. They were just sort of treading water. and. And so everybody else that was in that group was just treading water. And here I am trying to start off my career and it just, it, it, you can spin your wheels as much as you want, but really there was never any upward growth. So that's kind of the first thing. If you surround yourself with good people that are actively pursuing the same goals that you are, you're more likely to get to those goals faster. And that's something where you know, knowing what your corporate culture is and knowing what your goals are is really important sort of from the start. Um, this, the second thing kind of goes piggybacks off of that, which is that if you're surrounding, if you're surrounding yourself with good people, they're going to encourage you to recognize what your value is. And when you're first starting off, you're, you know, you're still learning. There's a lot of things that you still have to, you know, um, you know, wrap your head around as you're learning the job. But the further you get into a career, the more you realize how much value you actually add to people's lives, whether it's preparing tax returns or helping them with internal controls for audits, or if you're a financial advisor, that you're helping them with estate planning or their investments. That, I mean, some people it may be easy for you to do it, but for other people, it really isn't. And it is something that, that provides value to you, to your clients. So it's, again, it's recognizing that the stuff that you know how to do is valuable and don't be, you know, don't hide behind it. So recognize your value is sort of the, the, the one thing I'd learned kind of the hard way. And then the other thing too is, you know, as Joe mentioned, you know, don't get yourself tied up with one job per se. If, if something happens where something isn't working out, don't be afraid to leave because the building won't burn behind you as, as you're leaving. So you have to make sure that, that what you're doing makes sense for you, you know? So that's, that's the, the third kind of thing that I had to learn, which is, you know, I felt guilty leaving a small firm because it's a small firm and I felt, hey, I'm helping to hold this thing up. Nope, life goes on without you. So do what you need to do first. You get to be your own champion. So I think that's, those, those are three things that, I, that come to mind for things I learned the hard way. I'm sure there's more to come still. Thank you. And the last formal question for Joe. Can you provide examples of actions you took to achieve promotion at AirDrop? Yeah, so the first thing you need to do is figure out why 
exactly you want the promotion. I mean, obviously money is one of the reasons, but you know, a title doesn't really mean anything. I could be a senior associate making a million dollars a year. I don't need to be called a partner, like as long as you get paid. Um, but you also need to understand the new responsibilities that come with it. If you're, you know, getting promoted and you don't understand really the base concepts, how are you going to review someone else's work if you don't even know what you're looking for? You know, and back to uh, everyone else's point, you know, in public accounting, they do promote you very fast. But if you don't know what to review because they just promote people, then, yeah, some little new kid's going to give you something. You're going to look at it, say it's okay. And then the partner's going to come back to you and say, why are you handing me this shit? It's all wrong. You know, you got to understand what you're trying to do, you know, but how to get promoted. Like I said, you know, raise your hand, put in extra time. You know, everyone says work-life balance is important. Partners or the, we'll call them the older generation, let's say, that are the people making the decisions. They don't care about work-life balance. They want to see you responding to emails on the weekends and at night and late you know, whenever early in the morning, because at least in accounting anyway, you're a service provider. The client is always right. And you can say, oh, well, I'm sorry. You know, I want to take a day off so I could have a mental health day. The client needs an answer. They don't want to see your mental health day. So, you know, one thing I did, I just was always responsive. I put my work email on my phone. I'm not saying I sat up after a night of drinking, trying to figure out hard problems, but you respond to an email. Thanks for sending this over. I'll get to it in the morning. Just so they see that you're responsive and you're paying attention. And then the partner knows, oh, wow, this kid's staying up late, responsive. The client knows. And you just look better as a person. And that's uh, really it, I guess. Make yourself stand out. Thank you very much. I think that's something to keep in mind for uh, business majors who you know, both early in their career. And so my final question for Deanna is, uh, what was the transition like from an assistant accountant to a senior audit accountant? Was there a noticeable or a difference? Um, so yeah, I kind of just touched on this before a little bit, but the transition from assistant to senior, there's definitely a change. I mean, you're doing different work. You're doing kind of more challenging audit areas. Um, but as far as, I just want to touch a little bit on what Joseph said. So I think a lot of that, as far as accounting, um, it's that's really determined by the company. Like for instance, the company that I'm with right now, um, we do have unlimited PTO. We do take those mental health days. We have it, posters all over the walls. Um, we don't work crazy hours. They don't want you to work crazy hours. There have been numerous amounts of weeks where I'm like, you know what? Let me just get to this over the weekend. Like I'll have it ready for you on Monday. And they're like, why? Like, why, why would you work on the weekend? And that's coming from the partners like on our team. So I think it all just depends. I mean, I work in healthcare non for profit um, I don't know if other areas like commercial or things like that may be different um, or tax. I've never done anything tax related. Um, so that could be different, but as far as my team here, they really do emphasize you as an employee over the clients. We have a whole bunch of clients that they kind of just let go because they started this new survey where you we can give our feedback on their clients. So if we have bad clients that don't respect our time, they don't get us things timely, they're not the nicest people to work with and it's very challenging we can submit those surveys and then it goes through the partners. And I've had two clients in only the two years that I've had that have been cold, which means that they're gone. We got rid of them because they don't value us and our time. Um, so I definitely think that's like firm specific because that I haven't had any of those kind of experiences. Um, but as far as back to the assistant to the senior, yeah, I mean, you're going to have a different workload. You're jumping a couple levels. Um, but as long as you know what you're doing and you are surrounding yourself with those good people, then you can feel comfortable asking whatever questions you have. You can learn through your peers. You can, and I don't know, it, it wasn't 
as crazy as I think it sounds. Um, and yeah, that's kind of all I have to say. Thank you. Kristen, since I asked you a third formal question during your first one, I will ask you a question from the general question section um, as your third formal question. So the question is, what class slash coursework at Oneonta do you feel prepared you most for your field of work? Um, I would say not-for-profit accounting, um, pretty obvious, but I also thought like Excel and Word were helpful. We're dealing with that literally every day. Um, I like learning just little tricks here and there, anything to make things be more efficient. Um, yeah, and I mean, all the accounting classes really have come in handy, like for the CPA exams and for like, sometimes I'm on, uh, I work with POST reports, which is actually a different team. Um, it's not really with the audit team. And I had a client that had financial statements that were actually set up like a governmental entity, even though they weren't a government. Um, but yeah, so you're going to need to know random things like that, even though you're not working in tax or you're not working in audit or something. It's just good to know. Um, you don't really know what is going to come up. So. Thank you. So we'll figure out my question, Christopher. How do you become a member of the Audit and Finance Committee for the Catskill Symphony Orchestra Governing Board? Also, how has the Catskill Symphony benefited you? So this is one of those things where, again, going back to my career path, it was, the Catskill Symphony was actually originally a client of the first CPA firm that I worked for. And um, I became friends with the executive director and at some point during a different audit that we we're doing, the president of the board at the time had approached the partner and said, hey, do you mind if, if we, you know, ask Chris to be part of the board and, you know, by extension, part of the audit and finance committee? Um, you know, local nonprofits are always looking for, for, for talent um, and they, they, they needed somebody who had accounting background. So that's, it was a natural fit. And of course, um, you know, I'm a musician play multiple different instruments. So that was sort of a no brainer as far as you know, how I ended up joining that board. But really that was, that was sort of being in the right spot at the right time and knowing, um, uh, you know, being, having, having strong client relationships with, with the people who you're working with. So it's, that's part of how I got onto that board. Um, how the Catholic Symphony benefited me other than just, you know, it's, it's a place where you can network obviously but it also happens to be the place where I met my current um, current boss. So uh, one of the other financial advisors on our team was also on the audit and finance committee uh, audit and finance committee board at the time, and she saw me as a young CPA that was you know trying pretty hard to uh, you know be a treasurer and doing all these different things to keep the books straight and helping everything out, and she took a liking to me and it ended up being the uh, position opened, you know, on her team at Morgan Stanley. And during the pandemic, she reached out and said, hey, if you ever get tired of doing tax returns and doing audits, you know, we should have dinner. And, you know, it took, it took a little bit of time for me to, to come around to that idea. But eventually, that's how I ended up here in this role. And it's, it's all through basically being on a nonprofit board. So, you know, it's it's volunteering for the community, but it's also networking, and you have you just never know when when those those connections warm up for you. So that's that's a success story for that. Thank you very much. And as we have worked through the specific um, questions, we will now move on to the general Q and A section, where anyone from the audience can ask a question. So I will now open the floor to the audience if they want to ask any question. To any audience member, anything they would like? Any questions? Monkey shot. You? No, I don't know. Uh, so I'm in the CPA program here. So I was just wondering is there anything that <laughs> I could get a jump on besides studying for the exam? Uh, is there anything else that I could get a jump on or get to learn earlier so I could? 
So what's doing here is that the question was that he's already in the CPA program. And if there was anything additional he could do besides studying that could really help him get a jump on the program and improve his chances. Anyone can respond. Internship, right off the bat, get an internship, anything. But, but that, that's one of those things where they're looking for work experience right off the bat. So that, that for me was, especially if you end up finding a place that you like, and, and if, again, if you work your butt off, like Joe says, you know, they'll, they'll notice. And they're, I mean, like, for example, my, in, in, in my situation, they weren't actually looking to hire somebody, but because I was, you know, kicking butt on the, on the tax prep side of things, at the end of my internship, they, they offered me a job right after. So, and the, the, the other thing that comes out of it is if you don't like the place where you're interning, that's something you know is, hey, this is something to watch out for in the future. So I, I think an internship, it's a great resume builder and it's, if it's paid, all the better. Thank you very much. Um, would anyone else like to reply to this question? Else. Yeah, I mean, as far as getting a job, like Chris said, internship, networking, when, I don't know, whatever accounting firms come up, PwC, or I don't know if Danable and McKee still come, or wherever everyone works, you know, just go meet people, shake their hands, you know, again, try to stand out so that they'll remember you when they go back to their office, you know. Because then when you send them a thank you email, send them the resume, they'll be like, oh, this was the kid that, you know, whatever, asked a good question. And even if it's a small firm or a big firm or whatever, and you don't like it after a year, you could always switch. There's a shortage of accountants out there. It is a very high demand industry. Like, you know, there's only two things starting in life, death and taxes. And as long as you're an accountant, you'll have a job. <laughs> Pretty encouraging, but also a little uh, sad on the inside. <laughs> if you do estate planning, you can cover both. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Um, any other questions to the audience? <laughs> the question was, do you have any advice for preparing for internships? Whether that be what? Interviews. Oh, for interviews. For interviews. Preparing for interviews, that was the question. Yes, do you have any advice for preparing for interviews? Um, I would say definitely do some research on who you're interviewing with. Go on their company website, look at what they offer. If they have certain, like we have four cornerstones that we try to abide by, like people, client service, those things. Um, try to throw in a couple of details about the firm, what you like about them, uh, but also just honestly be yourself. I know it sounds cheesy, but majority of my interview, I talked about Lake George and that I worked there for eight summers and the partner that I interviewed with loved Lake George. And so we had an instant connection and we just talked about more life than necessarily the audit world and accounting things. Um, so don't lose like your personality, because that's important in this job. It can be a little mundane sometimes, um, but if you have a good personality and you, that, that will like, that will show through. And then that is what will make you stand out to the people. That's what made me stand out to the one partner. We still talk about it a couple years later that we actually just we went to a wedding and he was there and we were discussing and he was like, yeah, I didn't even ask you a single like accounting question. We just talked about Lake George and Saratoga and just things that we had in common. So just don't lose sight of like you as a human being as you step out into the real world, so. And just to add to that, um, you should try to think of, you know, you always have to ask a question, they teach you that, but try to come up with a creative question, not the same cookie cutter question that you ask everybody. Um, you know, I've done the interviews and really what they tell you is, you know, just look for someone that you would want to hang out with after work and, you know, go to happy hour. with. You're going to be stuck with this person if you hire them for 40, 50 hours a week. You know, obviously 
they like you enough based on your educational experience because that's what got you the interview. You know, we as the interviewers understand that you have no technical knowledge. We're not going to ask you technical questions. We just want to see, can you, you know, hang? Like, are you just going to sit in the corner, clock in at nine, leave at five? Okay, we don't need that. We need someone to participate in the volunteer hours or the, you know, holiday parties, join the committees, whatever. You know, we want someone that we would want on our team, you know, an asset. So make yourself that asset. Thank you very much. Remember, Lake George. Um, <laughs> so, any other questions? Are you relating to anything at all? Any questions? Sean? Um, when you start a career, a lot of times people will fall victim to the politics. So, what advice would you guys actually give to anybody trying to build a good foundation? So the question was that when starting off in a career or a job, people often feel that they have imposter syndrome. And so what advice would you give to kind of save that off or avoid it and push forward with your career? Anyone can respond? <laughs> well, do you want to define uh, imposter syndrome? In other words, that you're you're pretending to be an auditor when you still don't know the job. Is that what you're you're asking? That is the question, the general question. Yeah. I mean, let's, let's put it this way. I think everybody it has to start someplace, and you're not expected to know everything about everything. It's, it's quite literally impossible. What they're expecting you to do is that if somebody does ask a question that you try and find the answer to it and that you're honest, but you say, hey, I'm, you know, it's, it's sort of like, you know, you're, you're the librarian. You don't know what's in all the different books in the library, but you know where to look and that you're gonna try and do your best to try and get to the right answer or point somebody in the right direction. So, you know, it's, it's not a matter that, I mean, again, it, none of us are Google, none of us are have, have the, the internal revenue service code memorized, none of us have the codification memorized except for Dr. Flynn. So, I mean, it's at some point, you just have to be yourself, be honest, and if somebody asks you a question, do your best to, to answer their, you know, that's, that's, what you're, that's what they're hiring you for. Um, um, I will also add that they do know that they know that you're coming in with if you haven't had an internship I didn't have an internship coming in they know that you're coming in that you're not going to know that much about the ins and outs like the software and exactly what you're testing how you're testing it things like that so it really is you learn as you go and it's a very hands-on type of learning I think that I did learn a lot at Oneonta, a lot of the basics, the fundamentals of accounting, but the most that you learn is on the job. That's where you're gonna get all of your experience. Um, you'll find your niche that you're good at, that you like, and then you'll go from there. If you can find the people in the firm that are helpful, there's no stupid question we say here. We ask each other, <laughs> probably we think that they're stupid questions, but no one else does. Like they you learn they want you to learn because they want you to grow and they want to invest in you so that you can make it to partner one day um and yeah that's what i would say so don't be nervous i said before i work on healthcare tax exempt and when the lady was showing me around my first day she was like okay you're gonna be on healthcare." and i was like mm, i went to school in accounting uh i don't really know what am i doing in healthcare?" like i genuinely did not know what this was going to even entail. So, but then you do a couple weeks later, you go through your trainings, you ask all your questions, you have a good support system with your peers here. And yeah, so I know it's easier said than done to not be nervous about starting something like that, but just try not to be. And everybody is always willing to help you at your firm. The other thing I'll mention is I think there was, I forget where I heard this quote, but it takes like 5,000 hours to be proficient at something. 
So it's it's pretty much impossible to go from zero to a hundred. I mean, it it takes. I mean, there's there's only so many ways you get to to five thousand hours, and that's just putting in the time. So in the first couple of you know months, years, I mean, you're just there's there's going to be stuff that stumps you, and you have to you have to power through it, and you have to be patient. Um, sometimes it's hard to be patient when you, you know you're, especially if you change from one career to, to another. You know, I went from being a tax manager and, and being relatively high up on a totem pole to, you know, basically going through, you know, going, you know, taking the CPA exam was, was, was difficult enough, but then you have to shift years and then you're taking, you know, uh, the series seven, the series 66 in order to get licensed for selling um, financial products. And it's, it's, it's a totally different, it's, it's a similar language, but it's a different language. And it takes time to get used to doing something like that. So again, it's, it takes time and you just have to be patient and persevere. Thank you very much. And uh, does anyone else have any other questions for any of the members? It could really relate to anything. Um, I'd like to have the graduation. Any questions? I have a question for Kristen. I am pursuing class and she's going to be about a 9.5, but she is very, very shy, very quiet. So Kristen, could you please share with these lonely people how you were able to get over that so that you could be so, so successful in your career? And they can apply it to maybe they're quiet and shy, maybe there's something else, but that was a hurdle you had to get over. You and I had many conversations in my office about, about that. Could you share some stuff with these folks? So that they would be as successful as you perhaps? Yeah, sure. Um, I'd say the thing that most helped me was making friends. Like, um, really, if I have questions or like just need someone to give me a little boost for the day and break out of my shell a little more. Like, if you have friends and feel comfortable with who you're hanging out with, um, who you're working with at work, like, you really gotta like make an effort to talk to other people and don't think that other people are trying to compete with you or anything like they really are there to help you they want to help the client they want to help the whole firm um well most people i guess but um yeah so just talk to other people even if it's just in small groups one-on-one -on -one. Um, that's kind of what helped me yeah, I was definitely a lot shyer in college, but, and get involved too. I was on the swim team and that helped me a lot. I had like automatic friends um, and it helped me network too, even to this day, so. Thank you, Preston. Thank you very much. And uh, anyone else have any other questions? Don't be shy, really, no response to anything you're relating to, to even a different field. So really, any questions at all? Well, for now, uh, I'll let you maybe think of a question in your head and we'll ask like a general question. Yeah. Um, okay, questions for anyone. What did day-to-day -day activities ever look like for you? Okay. Um, so day to day, tip, well, it depends on the week. Sometimes I'll be at a client. So if I'm at a client, it looks a little different. I'll set up, um, I'll find whoever the client contact is that I have. And usually they have a big stack of papers for me or a bunch of emails um, with a bunch of support to go through. And really we're just working in Excel. Um, you know, we do like front interviews with some of the employees. Um, you're primarily talking to like CFOs, controllers, like people at the top of the company. Sometimes you'll talk to like a regular employee, but not typically. You're mostly in the finance department. Um, yeah, um, you'll have like meetings and just a lot of like, spreadsheets and those types of things. I think as you move up, it's more like one-on-one -on -one with clients and things like that. But day one, it's really you, the senior, 
and just getting work done, looking through papers, making connections with clients. Um, yeah. Coffee. <laughs> Lots of coffee. I think that's an industry standard there. Yeah, you have to be a coffee drinker. If none of you are, then you got to change career paths. <laughs> Try economics. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. Um, next final question I wanted to answer. Did you have personal expectations for yourself outside of school? Personal personal expectations as in like life goals or you mean like work goals? Um, yeah, life goals. Actually, Joe might be a better person to ask this question, but no, I think I think you have to set goals for yourself. Otherwise, it, you just it, it's too easy to to you know just wake up, go to work, and then come back home and sleep and do it all over again. If you don't have some type of you know something to plan for, or something else to do, yeah, uh, it's it, you're you're sort of like a you're a drift at sea with with no particular place to go. And it's, that's not that's not a healthy thing. You just you get into a rut and then. You, know, you don't really progress that much. You do have to have some type of goals, both at work and, and at home. I mean, I agree. Uh, back in school, I guess I did not really, I don't know, maybe I didn't pay attention to it, but maybe the past couple of years, I've been paying attention to my expectations, um, both personally and professionally. Every week I start off, I sit in front of the, I get to work early, sit in front of my calendar, plan out my personal goals, professional goals, mental goals, how I'm gonna grow, you know, emotionally, professionally, everything. You know, do I wanna to go to some networking events this week? Do I wanna just go home and hang out, watch football with my friends? You know, what do I wanna accomplish for the week? And you just set it all out and then you see if you could accomplish it. You know, if you don't set goals for yourself, you're just kind of coasting along and you get complacent. And that, is pretty new. I mean, I've only been doing that a couple of years and it's, I don't know, I guess been helping me. Well, the thing I'm is the, okay. the, two, the two things dovetail into each other. So in other words, you don't work to live or make sure I say this the right way. In other words, you, 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 you don't live to work, you work to live. So, you know, if you're, if, if you're only, if your only goal is to go to, you know, work, work, you know, 50 hours a week, you know, that's, for me, that seems like it's a waste. So there's, there's other things to do in life. If that that's how you get satisfaction, of that's what your that's what your if, if that is what motivates you to wake up every day is to go out and help people, and that and doing that is help at work. Great, but there's other things that people do, and and you see it a lot in the financial advising world where people retire and they don't really have goals themselves, and if they don't, they really atrophy really quickly. The people who are really active and have active personal lives, you know, they'll be in their 80s and 90s and, you know, act half their age. So I think you do have to set goals that, that keep you, keep you moving. So it has to be a balance. I think work-life balance is a big thing. Definitely something to take serious. It's not, you can't just work. <laughs> you have to have a life. You have to have fun. You guys are young, <laughs> like you have to keep some of that and don't just think that, oh, I'm graduating and I'm going to go into a 70 hour a week job. Um, I don't think that that's what a lot of people want. And I think that if you can keep, like I was saying, in touch with who you are as a person, keep your friends outside of work, make friends at work, um, go to a firm that has a lot of work events that are fun, like we just had our holiday party. Yes, it was people that we work with, but it's all friends of ours and it's a fun time. Um, I definitely think that it's important to have that work-life balance or else you'll drive yourself insane. Thank you, other responses. Yeah, Joe, you wanna go first? I'll ask again if there's any other questions. Any other questions from the audience? Any last minute questions? 
for Revlon. Right. Well, um, I would like to make a closing statement about the President here, Logan. He will be graduating this winter, and he has been a student here for four years, and he has had many accomplishments, such as being the representative of the President Advisory Council on Sustainability, the Carson Award for Best Academic Paper and Senior Seminar, President of Omnicron Delta Epsilon International Honor Society of Economics, a word for right there. But he has accomplished many things that Sunni Onyanza, and he has helped the Economic Club push forward for the last two years. So I'd like a warm round of applause for him. I also want to thank um, board panelist members for showing up and answering our student questions and responding to our questions. It was very useful. And uh, thank you to the audience for showing up. And that's all we have for today. Thank you very much. Feel free to connect with them or leave them right after or message them or anything. Other names are available. Thank you very much. Bye, guys. Yeah, they're all good.